One of the most surprising towns in the Bolton Borough is Kersley. The inconspicuous main street reveals much more than first meets the eye if you know where to look. Nestled inside a peninsula in the River Irwell, Kersley was an agricultural village until the 19th century. But the Industrial Revolution changed all of that. Coal pits and mills were established all around the village, expanding its population and prosperity. A large electric power station was also built here and dominated the area, but today only the street names and memorials reveal Kersley's hidden past. As you walk along Bent Spur Road down the Manchester Road beside the St Stephen Parish Church, you'll notice a school by the same name. The school's located on your right, but it was previously found on the left just after the church. In fact, the school preceded the church by 11 years and was commissioned to provide the growing parish population in this area of Kersley, then called Kersley Moor, with an educational facility for children. The children working in the mills had little time for education. The principal means of education for them at the time was the Sunday schools. The scheme of building the church and school started in 1860. Two prominent people of the area, John Fletcher and Harrison Blair, a mill owner and first chairman of Kersley Local Board, respectively, decided both were needed here. A small school was built at the cost of £300, which both contributed to. Blair also promised an additional £30 a year, about £30,000 today, to pay for a master for the school. Other donations came from the parish and the first school was built along with a master's house. The church itself was built in 1871, funded by the family of the late Harrison Blair, at the cost of £3,600. The land was donated by another prominent family, the Starkey family. It was a large building with seating for 538 people. The churchyard includes the graves of 19 miners killed in the Unity Brook Colliery disaster and a memorial inside. The school was a great success. Initially operating as a day school, it had over 120 pupils, including those who attended Cellar School that closed that year. A few months later, a night school also opened with 40 scholars, intended for older children or adults, who worked during the day and wanted to further their education. In 1910, the number of pupils grew to almost 600. It was decided a new school would be built across the road, which you see today. The Starkey family sold the land at a nominal one penny per square yard, which is about two pounds today. Funds were donated to help build the school, and again, much of that came from the Blair family. Looking at the map of Kersley, it's clear why this area, nestled inside the bend of the River Irwell, has been such a prosperous place with an interesting history. The township's name is derived from two Anglo-Saxon words, Kers, which is a reference to watercress, and Lee, meaning an open space. The Irwell Valley, where the first settlements in the area were located, provided the necessary means for agriculture to flourish. The first mentioning of Kersley appears in a deed from Lady Edith Barton. She owned the lands here, but donated them in 1222 to Cockersand Abbey in Lancaster. Other prominent families had parcels of land here as well, including the De Levers and the Holtons. These families remained major landowners into the 18th century. Their names are reflected in some of the villages and streets in the borough. Other famous families who owned land in the area were the Prestels, who gave their name to Prestel Lee, now Prestelly, just on the other side of the river. And the Seddons, whose names linked with the church and school on Ringley. Kersley and Farnworth were always regarded as one place until the Industrial Revolution. Kersley was governed by the Lord of the Manor, who lived in Farnworth. 
In 1798, the Farnworth and Kersley Enclosure Act merged the two towns. William Holton, who resided in Kersley Hall, was regarded as Lord of the Manor of Kersley. Kersley was dotted with farms and small corn mills, with the old Ringley Bridge being the only crossing over the river for miles around. People earned their living from agriculture, but the cottage industries also thrived. Families would spin wool in the evenings and sometimes even make it their main source of income. People were hired to push out the raw wool to those cottages, the owners of which would then leave the finished weaved wool on their doorstep in the morning for the pushers out to pick up and leave their wages. However, it was only during the Industrial Revolution that this location came into its own. In the early 1800s, the town had a paper mill, cotton mills, chemical works, an iron foundry and 15 coal mines. The number of mills grew over time, providing employment to the growing population. Additional schools and churches were built and new residential homes were built in the Moor area along Manchester Road. The reliance on the cotton industry had a disastrous effect on the towns in the borough and Kersley when the American Civil War broke out. All exports to and from America were banned. Over half of the people previously employed in the cotton mills were laid off. Despite a relief programme established by the government, families descended into terrible poverty. The mines were also subject to several major disasters in which many people were killed. One notable disaster includes the Unity Brook disaster, where 43 died and other disasters hitting major mines in the vicinity. Today, one mill remains as evidence of its rich industrial heritage and Kersley is now a residential town for people working locally or in nearby cities. However, the evidence of its rich past is all around and worth exploring. The area you're standing next to was once a hive of activity, with several active coal mines in the vicinity. This was because the newly opened mills operated on steam and required a lot of coal to keep the furnaces burning. Today, the minecart-shaped memorial and sign on the grass is all that remains of the mines. Coal mining was usually employment for life around the Bolton Borough. Here, next to Unity Brook, once stood a coal pit. This was Unity Brook Colliery, named after the small river that passed next to it. Coal mining was dangerous work, but families needed to eat, so every family member would usually end up down the mine. This was the case until 1862. Up until then, boys as young as six would go down the shaft, earning a wage as helpers. They were employed to pull carts or do other tasks, earning between two pennies and five pennies per day. In 1842, the government passed a law forbidding children under 10 to work in the mines. It also stopped women from working underground. Later, the age was raised to 12. The colliery here was opened in 1868. It's located about 55 metres south of Manchester Road. Until the fateful day of the mine disaster, there had been no accidents and it was considered safe. This false sense of security led to tragic consequences. At the time, miners used safety lamps that had open flames inside metal cages. The metal cages helped prevent an explosion if the miners came into contact with flammable gases. However, the cages also meant lighting was very poor. In this mine, the miners removed the safety caging because it had an excellent safety record, allowing the naked flame to directly contact the surrounding air. On the morning of the 12th of March 1878, before starting the working day, the underlooker, the man in charge, discovered a crack in one of the tunnel's roofs. A support was installed and the tunnel was considered safe. When the miners returned from lunch, the rope holding the metal cage that lowered the miners down the shaft 
snapped and the cage fell to the bottom of the pit. The air was probably already full of gas from the crack and when the cage hit the ground, it triggered an explosion that was heard a quarter of a mile away. As a result, 43 men and boys died. The Enian family lost their father Robert, aged 39, and his two sons, Jonathan, aged 12, and David, aged 13. An inquest blamed the explosion on the use of unsafe lamps, and it was decided going forward all miners would have to use safety lamps. This didn't completely stop the risk of other explosions, as the safety lamp weren't 100% safe. The Unity Brook Colliery was reopened shortly after the disaster, but the pits closed for good in 1881. As you look at the junction with Fernside on your left, all you'll see now is the new residential estate. However, look at the map from 1988 and in the same spot, you'll see just one distinctive building, Kersley Hall. The manor house was built by William Holm in 1670 as one of his residences. William Holm was a lawyer from Bolton who owned land in Lancashire. His father owned Holm Hall in Reddish, but William bought the land and estate here in 1653. The house was one of the grandest in the area and it accounted for seven of Holm's 39 taxed hearths. This tax was introduced in 1662. It was calculated by the number of fire sources in a house, such as fireplaces. At the time of its introduction, it was set at two shillings a year for each fire source, about £380 today. The hearth tax was one of several based on the number of fixtures on a house, such as the number of windows. Holm was a benefactor in the area around Greater Manchester, with several institutions named after him. Here, the street you'll continue walking on bears his name. He didn't have a son or heir when he died in 1691, so after his wife's death, the Holmes Trust was set up in Oxford to support poor students throughout their studies and four years after graduation. It's not known how many students benefited from his charity. However, given the number of years it has been running for, it's likely to be high. The hall was demolished in 1927. The Lancashire Electric Power Company bought the area and built a power station benefiting from the coal pits in the area. The power station was demolished in the 1980s and the site was redeveloped into the housing estate you see today. This fine bridge over River Irwell is one of the oldest in the borough. A wooden bridge situated here was swept away in 1673 and a stone replacement was commissioned at the cost of £500, worth almost £2 million today. The new bridge was opened in 1677, featuring two main arches and a smaller one on the west bank. The two piers have triangular cutwaters that carry up from the water level to the main parapet between the two main arches. Until the 1930s, it was the only bridge across the River Irwell for miles. The bridge was known to be a preferred location for up and down fighting. During annual holiday weeks, men would strut across the bridge, challenging anyone to a bare-knuckle fight. While the bridge is narrow, only about three metres wide, it was open to vehicular traffic until 1946. It became a national monument in 1950 and is now a footbridge only. As you cross Ringley Old Bridge, you'll see a church tower situated on the grass. A church does stand a bit further back and there are instances of a church tower being detached from the main church building, but this isn't the case. The tower was once part of the second St Saviour's Church, located here from 1826 until 1854. The first St Saviour's Church was built here in 1625. That date can be seen above the now bricked entrance to the tower, inside the semicircular frame, on a stone plaque saying, Nathan Woolworth builded me, Anno do 1625. 
Nathan Walworth, who is mentioned in the inscription, was born in 1572. He studied law and in 1630 he became a steward for the Earl of Pembroke, managing Baynard's castle. He was a wealthy man and along with his wife, Ellis, donated the funds required to purchase the land and build the church. Bishop Bridgman consecrated the chapel in December 1634. Woolworth dedicated Ringley Chapel not to a saint but to the Holy Saviour. He left his friend, Peter Seddon, in charge of the church's construction and corresponded frequently with him. A total of 57 of their letters survive and are documented in the book The Correspondence of Nathan Woolworth and Peter Seddon of Outward and other documents chiefly relating to the building of Ringley Chapel. This book's regarded by scholars as providing an insight into the turbulent period in which these people lived. Throughout the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the defeat of the Spanish Armada and the ascension to the throne of King Charles I. Walworth didn't stop there. In his will, dated 1640, he ordered funds to be allocated to construct a school next to the chapel. The school building continued to be used until 1798 when it collapsed and a new school was built in the same place. Unlike the old school building, which had schoolmaster accommodation, the new building only had classrooms. It also had room for 100 pupils from the age of six. The children were taught to read free of charge, but further education in writing and arithmetic carried a small fee. The school continued to operate here until 1872, when it moved to a new location elsewhere in Ringley. The old church became too small for the growing population and became run down and had to be replaced. A new church building was erected in 1826, funded by a charity commission, but it only served for 27 years. It was demolished in 1854 because once again it was too small for the growing parish. Only the tower remains. A new church was built a bit further away from the tower on the same plot which still serves today's community. Behind the wooden fence inside this short cul-de-sac is a residential estate. However, it was once the location of one of the town's largest employers, the Fletcher Paper Mill. Like many other mills in the area, it took advantage of the River Irwell for its paper making. Looking at a map of Kersley from 1913, one stretch of the river had three large mills on the river banks. Kersley Mill is the only one still standing, although it's now a general industrial building. The original mill started operating as a textile mill and bleach works in 1826. But soon afterwards, the Crompton brothers who owned it changed their strategy and started manufacturing paper. Papermaking was an industry that was growing at the time. When Robert Fletcher joined the company, he quickly became a general manager. Fletcher made the company an international success. The mill became one of the world's leading manufacturers of fine tissue paper. When the Crompton brothers died, Fletcher was rewarded for his services and given the option to purchase the mill, which he did. Both the Crompton family and later the Fletcher family lived in Vale House when they were in town. Vale House is just across the mill in what's now called the Parklands. Robert Fletcher died in 1865, but his sons John and James inherited the mill and continued to run it successfully. This increased the family's prominence in the town. Their standing in the community was shown when Kersley and Farnworth merged because of the Local Government Act, 1858. But his influence over the district's decision-makers led to the formation of the Kersley Urban District Council in 1899. The death of John Fletcher is a sad one, ending with murder. One evening in 1889, after attending the old market in Farnworth, Fletcher had a debate with a young man. They decided to settle it over a drink. 
that young man had already marked Fletcher as a victim for robbery, and as they drank, he slipped poison into Fletcher's mug. While the poison took effect, the young man hailed a cab to be alone with Fletcher. During the ride, the cab driver noticed the door was open. He stopped to find the young man had disappeared and Fletcher was dead in the seat. The police found the cause of death to be poisoning and Fletcher missing £120 and his gold watch. This was a considerable sum of money, about £90,000 today. During the 1890s, foreign competition meant paper manufacturing costs had to be reduced. The Fletchers didn't want to reduce the workers' wages, which were already very low, at six shillings, five pennies an hour. Their employees worked an 85-hour week and only earned enough for the bare minimum. Instead, they created two 12-hour shifts, reducing each worker's hours but maintaining their weekly wages. This way they increased their production by 75%, with only a slight increase in labour costs. Under the new management of Sidney Dean Whitehead in the early 20th century, the demand for cigarette paper increased rapidly and the mill moved to electric operation using machines. It also created three shifts of eight hours without reducing the workers' weekly wages. The Fletchers' consideration of the workers' welfare led to them establishing a committee of workers and management representatives to settle any disputes and grievances. This was so successful that the committee continued operating it until the mill closed in 2001. In 1943, the company created a pension scheme for workers and widows of men who died in service. Towards the end of the 20th century, the cost of wood pulp, soaring energy prices and the high value of the pound meant the mill's operation was no longer viable and they closed in 2001. The cenotaph, situated in front of newly built residential buildings, is a place of interest. The houses are built on the former Kersley Town Hall site, which was demolished in 2013. This explains the cenotaph's location. The town hall was a former manor house called Highfield House. It was purchased by the town for £650 in 1910, about £400,000 today. The council had rented rooms on the ground floor until then, but it needed more space as the town grew. The solution was to purchase the entire house. The town hall witnessed one of Bolton's most important historical events, when Bolton Wanderers won the FA Cup in May 1958, beating Manchester United. The winning team went through the streets in Kersley, stopping outside the town hall to wave to the 5,000-strong crowd who came to greet them. The cenotaph was erected in 1921 to commemorate the fallen of World War I. There's a plaque listing the 151 men who died and an additional plaque of 61 men who died in World War II.